because Jesus was unable to bring himself back from the dead. Why? Because he was dead, dead. And what can the dead do? Nothing. And so at that moment, Jesus Christ was trusting in the hands of his father, the faith of his resurrection. Genesis 37. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock of his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpha, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers. Behold, I've dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told this to his fathers and to his brother, his, father, his brothers, his fathers rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow us? bow ourselves to the ground before you. And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and, is, and Israel saw, said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him, from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, They have gone away, for I've heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, and before he could come near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of this of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to, him, said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, do not, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph, Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors he wore, and they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their, cam their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh, and on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Israel. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, This or that boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it's your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, This is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. 
Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. And his son, all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Shul to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him into Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Thanks, Pastor Buddy. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jim, for reading for us. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for your word um, and how it speaks to us. And uh, even through chapters like these, where there's just so much detail carried in your word, oh Lord, that we may not always uh, fully understand or see, but uh, yet your message is so clear and transparent in it. And so we pray that you will give us the eyes of faith to be able to see it, and you, that you will prepare our hearts and our souls to be able to receive what you do indeed have to say to us this morning. And we pray all these things in the Lord Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. Good morning to you all. I just want to start off by uh, just checking hands up if any, uh, anyone in the room has ever heard of Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov. Anybody? In the room, hands up, ah, Stanislav Petrov, anybody heard of him? Yep, neither did I, until a few uh, weeks ago. But it turns out that this man, a man, the world over, owes him such a huge debt. Because on September 26, 1983, during the heights of the Cold War, Petrov was actually the commander in charge of a secret Soviet uh, 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 nuclear missile early detection sort of bunker uh, just outside of Moscow. And at about midnight that evening, they had detected the system, the monitoring system had gone berserk as it detected five nuclear missiles launched from the U.S. towards the Soviet Union. Now, Petrov only had about, uh, about a few minutes, about 15 minutes, to respond, uh, respond, to follow protocol, which dictated that he needed to actually initiate a sort of a, a counter strike towards the US and NATO, ensuring that there would be mutual destruction on both sides and catapulting the world into a nuclear apocalypse. And so in a room of about 120 panicked officers and engineers, Petrov chose not to press the red button. Chose not to press it out of a hunch that it was perhaps a false alarm. And so terrified and unsure as to whether they had made the right decision, they waited for conclusive uh, evidence that it was indeed a nuclear attack from the West towards the Soviet Union. Now, that confirmation never came. Never came. And then months later, after a secret Soviet investigation, it was discovered that a realignment of the sun, clouds, and the satellite position was what had triggered that false alarm. Folks, can you even imagine that? That that's how close the world got to being obliterated by nuclear weapons. You got to feel for those poor Soviets, right? How would they have explained themselves to human history, throughout human history, say why they had initiated a full-scale nuclear war to simply try to justify themselves by saying, no, the sun made us do it, right? And so... Uh, and, 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 and so for his nerve, in having kept his nerve and averting a nuclear apocalypse, Petrov was dubbed as the man who saved the world. There's even a documentary with that title depicting telling of his story. And so much, much against some of the acclaim he would later receive in life because the Soviets only disclassified that information about 15 years later. <laughs> later, Petrov was adamant and humbly insisted, and I quote, I was simply doing my job. And I was the right man at the right time. That's all, end quote. And so history is just full of certain examples, inspiring stories, right, of where one person, an individual's actions, ends up actually impacting the fate of so many people. And so just like Petrov's decision that evening landed up saving millions of lives across the globe, being destroyed by nuclear weapons, 
So also we see in Genesis 37, we see a, a series of actions set in motion. How Joseph, in the story of Joseph, how Joseph will then go on to actually saving nations across the world. Because Joseph would find himself right at the center of a divine plan, God's divine plan, where God was intricately weaving together seemingly unrelated circumstances and actions so as to bring to pass his ultimate good plan and purpose for the world. Now, the story of Joseph is such a well-known story that, it, uh, uh, that, that then leads us to make certain assumptions about the story that are not necessarily, uh, necessarily what the text itself would speak about or would reveal. Now, during the week, uh, through our small group uh, uh, gospel communities discussion, note, we'll touch on one or two of those assumptions that we make from this particular text, Genesis 37. And so I won't get into it yet this morning. But enough just to say that in this chapter, there are lots of details. Lots of details that can send us down all sorts of rabbit holes. And then before long, we can no longer distinguish between from the woods and the trees. And then lose our focus on what the author actually intends for us to glean from this particular chapter. Because in fact, there's only a simple far part. Far part structure to this particular chapter, Genesis 37, with actually a critical pivotal point in the middle, which gets so easily ignored. We don't even notice it as you read the story, but it will prove to be the turning point, the pivotal moment in the story that reinforces and clarifies the narrative's meaning, intended meaning. And so what are those parts? Part one is verses one to 11, where we see tension building. A, a building around, around Joseph. And so Jacob's favoritism and love towards Joseph only intensifies Joseph's brother's hatred and jealousy towards him, uh, towards him, only made worse through his dreams of ruling over them. And so it is a volatile family environment with an impending sort of kind of explosion, uh, explosion that we think is coming up ahead. Part two, Verses 12 to 14 sets in motion the conflict. As Joseph, trusted by his father, is sent to investigate his brother's de uh, dealings around the family business, only, and as you read those verses, you sense the suspense uh, around it all. What is going to happen as Joseph lands, lands up going, uh, reconnecting with his brothers? And so then, true as Bob, part four. Part four. Verses 18 to 28, that eight, so that we see this, uh, things just unravel quickly. Things get out of hand as Joseph's brother's hatred towards him leads them to conspire to kill him. Now, how much must you hate your own sibling to want to kill them in cold blood? That's how much they hated their own brother. But through Reuben's intervention, and later Judah's persuasion, Joseph's life is spared, but only to be sold into slavery instead. But yet the brothers, were not, they themselves were not spared from the traumatic uh, uh, incident of selling their own brother Joseph into slavery was, because what you'll read decades later in Genesis 42, that they were not quite able throughout their lives to rid themselves of the debilitating guilt they felt at witnessing Joseph's distress as he begged and pleaded with them for mercy. Which then finally leads us to part five, the end of the story, uh, end of the story where we get hints, uh, 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 hints that the story of Joseph is far from being over. And so the author allows us in, in the reader, to actually see that jo uh, Joseph, though he is being mourned for back home, is far from being dead. Far from being dead in the land of Egypt. In fact, we read this all crucial verse, verse 36, upon which the narrative ends on. Meanwhile, as Joseph is being mourned for back home, the Midianites had sold Joseph 
in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Now, what is this verse doing? This verse is so crucial because what it is doing is it is shifting our gaze to Egypt. Redirecting our attention to what is about to transpire there in Egypt. And so then, by ending the narrative in this way, what is the author doing? The author is revealing to us that Joseph's journey into Egypt was divinely orchestrated. That Joseph's journey into Egypt was divinely orchestrated, which then takes us back to part three, which I deliberately left out until now, so that we could see the significance of this pivotal moment in the narrative. And so as Joseph begins his journey from home, from the Valley of Hebron, to go find his brothers in Shechem, that, which was about an 80K journey, which it would have taken him several days to make. It is only understandable that once he gets there and he cannot find, uh, that he will be somewhat lost and cannot find him where he thought they would be at, right? Because this was before the days of Google Maps, right? And shared live locations or um, um, uh, cell phones that you could quickly whip out and call one of his brother. Hey, brother Gad, where you at, Right? And so it's only understandable that, you know, he couldn't find them and, and that he would get lost once he had tricked all that way and couldn't find them. And so it was a near impossible task at that moment to somehow locate his brothers. But then enters verses 15 to 17, part three. For what do we read? It just so happened that a man. Not even told who this man is, found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man, who just so happened to know who exactly Joseph's brothers were, said, to Joseph, they have gone away for I just so happened to have overheard them say, let us go to Dothan, which was another, anywhere between another 26 to 32 Ks away. And so Joseph went after his, bro uh, his brothers all that additional way. And this time, it just so uh, happened that he found him at Arthur. That he found him at Arthur. And so this chance encounter with a stranger proved to be the turning point in Joseph's journey. And so this unexpected meeting with some stranger in the field led Joseph to be able to locate his brothers in Dothan, a connection that would alter the course of his life. That would alter the course of his life. Because what would have happened if Joseph didn't find his brothers? He would have probably have got, done what most of us would have done, right? Gone back home. And so therefore, he would have never have reconnected with his brothers, and he would have never have found himself in Egypt, where the text ends. And so given that, that, that reality, and also these additional two facts, the fact one, that the last time that his brothers were in the vicinity of Shechem, what did they do? They massacred the whole city. That's what they did. But this time in the sticks, what do we see? We see them hesitate to take just his one life. When they could have destroyed 500 others. They hesitate to do that. And then the second fact is that Dothan just so happened to be on the trade route 
for an Egypt-bound caravan. In fact, verse 25 tells us they sat down to eat. All they had to do is just look up, and there was a caravan, right? Offering them the opportunistic solution to get rid, to rid themselves of Joseph. And so given the way that the narrative ends and what transpires in part three, part three is, uh, uh, is intended to make us ask this question. Was that just some chance encounter with a stranger? Or was that the evidence of God's sovereign hand at work? Was that a chance encounter with a stranger or the evidence of God's sovereign hand at work? Decades later, Joseph himself will give us a conclusive answer to that question. As he reflects upon the events of Genesis 37 with his brothers who were afraid that he uh, afraid of his retribution towards them. Here's what he says to them, verse, chapter 50, verse 19. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Unlike how some of his brothers back in Genesis 34 had stood in the place of God. Joseph said, I'm not God. I'm not God. And then he adds, verse 20, as for you, specifically referring to the events in Genesis 37, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. You meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. So what is Joseph saying to his brother? He's saying that unexpected ambush I walked into in, through which you intended my demise, God worked through it to strategically place me in Egypt so that I will bring about his plans and purposes through it all. And so then affirming to us all what is actually the main point of Genesis 37, and it is this, that God's sovereign hand masterfully utilized every circumstance and human action of this chapter to strategically place Joseph in Egypt. That God's sovereign hand masterfully utilized every circumstance and every action in this, of this chapter to strategically place Joseph in Egypt. Now, before we jump to applications like, therefore, God's hand is always at work through every circumstance and action intended to bring you arm in life, we need to pause for a bit and actually wrestle with a few tough questions that that statement will bring about. Have to wrestle with some of those tough questions. Like, for example, does that then mean that God's sovereignty, because God is sovereign over every, every circumstance in our lives, does that then imply that God is somewhat complicit in some of the evil that befall us in life. If he is indeed my sovereign over it all. Now we will have to deal with that difficult conundrum later in Genesis 50. But enough just today that we wrestle with the question that that statement raises. And it is this, how are we to persevere? How are we to persevere through the chaos and challenges of, uh, uh, challenges of life when it's not clear, it may not be clear to us that God's hand is actually indeed at work through it all. How do we persevere through that? In other words, how do we trust in God's sovereignty <coughs> when the road ahead is actually shrouded with uncertainty and we're flying blind as, to, uh, as we regards to what God's plan Oh, for our lives. How do we trust in his sovereignty? You know? Because put yourself in Joseph's shoes for a moment. Thrust into a life of evil circumstances that you did not choose. Born into a family where you're adored by your father 
And then as a result, despised by your brothers. You're full of hatred and jealousy towards you. Kidnapped by your own brothers in a remote land. As you long to escape their murderous intentions. Left to rot in a pit, in the bottom of a pit. As you wonder whether you'll see the light of day again. Fearing that even if your brothers were to pull you out of that pit, they might have to silence you forever, right? So as to keep secret, as a secret, the mistreatment of you to your father. And so though the text doesn't say, to, uh, say this, they, uh, it doesn't tell us whether Joseph actually cried out to God at the bottom of that pit. We do know from Genesis 42, that he at least begged his brothers for mercy. And so what does that say? It says that Joseph wanted nothing more than to escape the predicament he found himself in. That's what he wanted. And yet, that never happened. Never happened. Instead of rescue, what does he, what happens? He's sold into slavery. And his nightmare only intensifies as he is cast into a downward spiral of horrors from there. Decades will go by. 13 years. Where Joseph is met with a constant barrage of heart-wrenching betrayal, abandonment, and suffering. Circumstances capable of crushing the spirit of the, ver uh, of the most resilient among us. How then do you say at that moment, over that, that, those de that decade, to you, Joseph, have faith that God is somehow masterfully at work beyond every event of your life, turning those events that are intended for your harm for your good? How do you say that? Because it's only natural, right? Only natural. That in, a mo in those moments where it seems like God is absent, or when it seems like God is unresponsive, and our struggles and our challenges just keep on piling on to feel like that even He has abandoned us. And so how do we trust in His sovereign hand in those moments? Why, when we feel like, why do these things keep happening to me? Why won't God show enough interest to want to intervene on my behalf? When the darkness of our suffering obscures the rays of hope for a future, how do you keep on trusting that your suffering will not ultimately lead to your downfall. How do you do? And so then, what are we seeing? We're seeing that Genesis 37 wants us to have to grapple, grapple with some of the raw emotions and turmoil that comes in having to trust God. I have to wrestle with that. Because you see, we the readers have been with the help of the author, have been led on in, in Genesis 37, to see how God is actually weaving every circumstance and action in that story to bring about his plan and purposes. But we need to not forget the crucial reality that none of the story's characters, none of them, had the benefit of that hindsight in real time. None of them did. Just as brothers thought they had condemned him to death through slavery in Egypt. Jacob thought that his son had been killed, torn apart by a wild animal in the wilderness. Joseph himself felt the sting of betrayal by his own loved ones and was lost to his home forever. And so none of the story's characters in real time would have guessed that somehow God is masterfully at work utilizing all this to bring about his plans and purposes to pass. 
And so all this is leading us to have to confront this reality about our lives in God. And it is this, that God's sovereign and providential hand at work in our lives, guiding every moment and situation and actions in our lives, often remains unseen and unheard of through the darkest moments of our lives. Now, you and I would wish that it were different than that, even if it was just for us so to give us some reason to be able to cope in the suffering and darkest moments of our lives, but that's not a guarantee. But what is guaranteed, though, that because of God's unchanging character, that His love and grace will remain steadfast, even when we cannot see it, or even when we cannot feel His presence, He will remain steadfast through it all. Because, I mean, just think about Joseph's situation. It takes 13 years before he will see, see, get out of the pit that he finds himself in. At which point do you remain hopeful that your breakthrough is just around the corner? At year two, four, five, seven, ten, that God will summer, summer, intervene and break through. At which point do you still remain hopeful? And yet, through it all, God never left Joseph. was alongside him, beside him, through it all. And so then, here's the reality that we have to come to terms with. And it is this, that our trust in God cannot be held hostage by limited perceptions or understanding of His ways. Our trust in God cannot remain hostage, that we will only trust God as far as we can see what he is up to, our trusting God cannot remain hostage by our limited perceptions and understanding of his ways. Friends, you won't always see what God is busy with and up to in your life. You won't. You may have answers. I mean, want, uh, have questions, but the answers to those questions may not always come. And yet God expects that you trust in Him still. That you trust in Him still. For the essence of faith is to trust in God even when we cannot see the way ahead or the end from the very beginning. Because imagine had Joseph somehow managed to escape the grasp of his brothers and slavery in Egypt. What would have happened? Millions of people, including his own family, that he would have returned to, would have perished in the famine that he would let us save them from. By being in Egypt. And here's the thing, though. Joseph could have never known would have never known that his absence in that moment, if he had a way out of that situation and Caesar, would have never known that his absence from Egypt would have led to such a calamity decades later. Would have never known. Nor could Joseph have predicted the ultimate good that God would accomplish through his suffering. And so though we may not always see or know, God sees. God knows. And He will remain gracious and loving and providential through it all. Through it all. And so then, friends, where does that leave us? It leaves us in having to entrust ourselves to God. To entrust ourselves to God. For only He or not, for only he ultimately, see, ultimately sees. We may want to, for his plans and purposes to be evident to us so that we would somehow trust him, so that somehow he would command our allegiance and our worship of him. That's not always the case. That's not always the case. We might not always see, we may not always understand, and that's a good thing. 
Because that means then there is a God big enough to be worshipped. As, and we can at least agree with the, on this particular point, the, the mystic poet and English writer, Evelyn Underhill, will go on to say, if God were small enough to be understood, then he would not be big enough to be worshipped. He was small enough for you to always understand what he was up to. And he would not be big enough for you to worship and to fall at his feet. And so, friends, we've got to disabuse ourselves. Disabuse ourselves of the notion of thinking that God needs to make his, his ways evident to us before we would deem that he is worthy of our worship. Money he sees and knows the road ahead, and he, and he calls you to trust in him despite it all. Despite it all. To remain steadfast through it all, even as he looks to bring about his plans through our lives. And so, therefore, then the call to us, what we're left for is to do this, is to simply surrender your faith despite the unknown. And the unexplainable to God's gracious hand. Surrender your faith. Despite the unknown. Despite the un unexplainable. To God's gracious hands. Why? For in God's economy. In God's economy. The safest place to be. Is in the palm of his providential and gracious hands. That's the safest place to be. Now, you and I do not have to rely on our own strength to trust God in this way. You know? Why? Because through Christ Jesus, God has not only laid for us a model through who through Christ in which to follow, but he makes it possible for us to trust Jesus in this, to trust in him in this way, through what Christ modeled for us. Because if you remember, what were Jesus' last words as he died on the cross and breathed his last? That moment of his darkest suffering, what did he do with his faith? Entrusted it to God. Luke 23. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Friends, do not minimize the impact of what Jesus Christ was modeling for us at that very moment. What do I mean? Christ Jesus was unable, unable to bring himself back from the dead. Why? Because he was dead dead. And what can the dead do? Nothing. And so at that moment, Jesus Christ was trusting in the hands of his father the fate of his resurrection. My father, only you now, only you can bring about what you have promised to fulfill. And so he entrusted himself, his faith, in the hands of God. And how did God reward that trust? God raised him up from the dead, seated him at his right hand, lifted him up as Lord over all, so that you and I who would trust in Christ Jesus have got every bit of confidence and assurance that whenever we draw to the, near, uh, to the throne of God's grace, he sees us through the cross that he has lifted up, and his promises, therefore, towards us are always yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And so Christ Jesus is our model. He's the one we look to. He's the one we come through as we entrust our faith in the hands of God. And so as we close this morning, sometimes it is in the lessons that we teach our children that we ourselves as adults can find some of the deepest truths. Like in the song, you know, Kitty's song called Worship You Forever. 
It's a, it's a real catchy little kiddie song, but like such deep truths. And so the song goes, you are God, you are life. What a lesson for our kids and us to learn that we are not. That you are God, you are life, I will worship you forever. You are God, you are life, I will worship you forever. If you, and if you have little kids, imagine them being able to proclaim this, that you knew me before I took my first breath. And you know the day that I will breathe the last. Why? Because you're the Alpha, Omega, beginning and end. And forever to you, I will sing. And may the lost refrain of the song be our cry of surrender to God, much like in the words of Jesus Christ. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Why? Because you're the only one who satisfies my soul. For you're the Alpha. Omega, beginning and end, forever to you. I will sing. Father, so we come on that note to say, Lord, you are God, you are life, and we are not. And therefore, you are worthy of our worship, even through the uncertainties, unknown and unexplainable things that we will come through, that will come through our life. Why? Because you knew us. In fact, your word says that you knitted us into your mother's womb and you know the day, oh Lord, that you will call us home. And your word says that those whom you hold in the palm of your hands, even our hair, the hair upon our heads are numbered. And so you're not taken by surprise, by surprise or by, by or somehow by chance by the events of our lives, but you are masterfully at work through it all. And so therefore, Lord, we cry out to you like our Lord Jesus Christ cried, that into your hands we commit our spirit and our lives. Lord, help us. Help us to be surrender our fate to you in those ways and as we do that you will not, not allow us to be put to shame for if only in this life we have trusted in Christ surrendered ourselves to Christ followed in the footsteps of Christ in humble surrender you would vindicate us whether it is in this life but then certainly in the one that is to come. And so give us the faith we need, O oh Lord, through every season and circumstance, even those in whom where it feels like your presence is absent and we cannot see, we cannot hear from you to trust that you remain sovereign over us, above it all. And as you remain sovereign over us, above it all, O oh Lord, we choose then to worship you forever. You have our trust. You have our worship. You have our all. Through Christ Jesus. And it is in his name, by the power of the Spirit, that we pray this morning and all God's people say, Amen.